Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It did not say that the weapon would not form. It didn't even say that the weapon would touch you. But the Bible said that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So even though we may be afflicted, even though we may suffer, even though we may struggle, the weapon shall not get the victory. God has already given us the victory through His Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. I don't know if there's anybody in here today that the weapon has formed against you and you thought it was going to prosper, but God reminded you that He is your protector, that He is your shield, that he is your partner, that he will raise up a standard against the enemy. And so even when the floodwaters come in, you will not drown, you will not die, but you will yet live. So God, thank you. Thank you for your divine hand of protection. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us. Thank you, Lord. For your un in 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 ununderstandable, incomprehensible love. Thank you, Lord. That you afforded to us without restriction. Could you imagine if God's love was based on our behavior? Could you imagine? None of us. I mean, that, that, none of us. But thank God that he freely gives. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Lord, we love you today. Yes, we do. Giving honor to God, who is my Father, Christ, His Son, and my Savior, and the Holy Spirit, who is my comfort and compass. I am just thankful to be yet alive. Thankful for another day's journey. Thankful. I'm just glad to be in the service one more time. Amen, amen. Thankful to God for my partner in life and in ministry. Minister Felicia B. Smith, so thankful and grateful for her presence here this morning and for all that she does, all that she is, um, not just to me and our family, but to God's kingdom. She is truly a blessing. And I, I'm saying that because, yeah, she's my wife and I love her and I should say those things, but it's very much true. If she wasn't, I would still say that she is a gift to the body of Christ. Yeah, amen. She just really is. Amen. Thankful and grateful to my babies, my girls who are here today. <laughs> uh, even to my oldest. I'm not sure if she's watching, but if she is, I love you. I love you all. The greatest, one of the greatest joys again is being your dad. And so I thank God that he has tasked me with that great privilege. And to you, Hope Church, and these preachers, amen. Thank God for each one of you. Um, I don't, I don't pretend to think that, you know, I am the greatest preacher pastor that there ever was, and, and I'm certainly under no uh, uh, delusion uh, that you had to come here, that you had to be here today, but I am thankful that you were obedient to God's will, that you got up out of your bed, and that you braved this sort of um, meh day of weather, right? That's the best way to describe it. We, We've had, you know, 80 degrees, you know, all, and then all of a sudden it's like, what is this? <laughs> it's man, <laughs> it's kind of a blah day, but yet again, this still is the day yeah. that the Lord has made. And we still are to rejoice and be glad in it. So uh, uh, we are going to go to the Word of God uh, and see what He has for us this day. Uh, but before we get there, I want to uh, offer a brief word of prayer. So please join me as we go to the throne of grace. The Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you. God, we thank you again for this day, this time, this opportunity that you have afforded us to gather here in this house. We've come in this house, gathered in your name to worship you, God. 
Uh, we thank you, Father, for all that's already been said and done. We thank you, Father, for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. And we pray, Father, that we would prepare ourselves to receive your word. I ask, oh God, that you would speak not only uh, to your people, but speak to me as well, God. Speak through me, God. Uh, help us, God, to hear what you want us to hear and to take, Father, that which you want us to take. Not just, Father, uh, to, to, to hold it, but to actually use it, God, to, to, to make it applicable to our daily lives, Father. Uh, God, I pray that if there are some who are struggling, who have come here today with cares and concerns, I pray that this word, Father, would encourage them. I pray, Father, for those that are already walking in your will, Father, that this, this word, Father, would encourage them to continue to walk in your will, Father. And I pray, God, that again, it would be to your glory, to your honor, and to your praise. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 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 So, uh, join me in the letter, uh, second letter to the Corinthian church, uh, as penned by the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. We're going to read a few three verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 starting at verse 7. We are going to skip a clause of that verse. It's weird kind of how the Bible can be broken up. Um, and we're going to go to the B clause. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 starting with the B clause. Are we there? Amen. I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Yeah, Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. So for the balance of the time that I have together, that we have together, the time that I have for preaching, I want to preach from this title, this topic, this thought, Defending Our Dependence on the Lord. Amen. Defending Our Dependence on the Lord. Church, I believe, this is just my belief, the greatest threat to a believer is doubt. The greatest threat that I find throughout the pages of the Holy Writ to the believer is doubt. Mm -hmm. Consider the Garden of Eden. When the tempter, the, the deceiver, came and approached Adam and Eve, approached Eve and, and said, did God really tell you that? And so here you see her wrestle with doubt. It was a reasonable doubt that was established, and therefore she determined to sin against God. And in so doing, Adam sinned against God, and, and now we understand from that moment forward there was established the separation between a holy God and an unholy humanity. Doubt. Sometimes, saints, our living for Christ can be difficult. Sometimes our living for Christ can be filled with challenges. Sometimes we are pressed on every side. Sometimes we feel like there's no way out. And then we have onlookers that are uh, uh, serving as skeptics, offering commentary that sometimes can create doubt. Mm -hmm. God, is this really how I'm supposed to live? God, is this truly the will you have for my life? 
And so uh, the Apostle Paul was, was dealing with this type of issue, this type of concern, as he was ministering to the people in Corinth. The Apostle Paul's relationship with the church at Corinth was complicated, to say the least. He had written them four letters. He had written them four letters. Right? Two of them didn't make it. Two of them never made it to them. But these two, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, made it to the canon of Scripture. And both of them addressed several issues. Like many early churches, the Corinthian church struggled to exist in a culture that espoused behavior in contravention to God's law. We still exist in, a so, in, in such a society. Right. Corinth's pervasive immorality threatened the integrity of the gospel message. And, and as a new congregation, they had to figure out what it meant to be Christian amid a pagan society. Mm -hmm. Dare I say, saints, we're not a new congregation, but we are still yet trying to figure out how to be Christian amid a pagan society. Yeah. We live in a world that is so judgmental. We live in a world that speaks against our stance for God. We live in a world that says we should be tolerant of sin. And yet God says that we should point out sin. And that we should run from sin. Also, due to the multi-ethnicity of the group, it wasn't always apparent as to how they were supposed to conduct themselves. Right. You know, you get you get two people together, and you're probably going to get some different opinions. Right. Get five people together. The, the numbers that they increase, you're going to get different ideas. Throw in different culture, different context, different upbringing. You're going to get some variance in opinion. And so they're sitting here trying to figure out how among this society that, that says you can have it all when you want it and however you want it, how do we be church? How do we be Christian? How do we live in a world that hates God? Well, Paul, he offered succinct and practical guidance regarding God's principles and precepts. However, in the course of his ministry to, to these believers, he found himself having to protect his apostolic authority from being discounted and discarded by them. Paul, along with his ministry companions, often encountered difficulties and dangers as they shared the good news. And because of it, a distrust in the legitimacy of his, ident uh, of his identity as an ambassador of Christ was put in jeopardy. And saints, this type of disbelief is still prevalent because of the unfortunate promulgation of a counterfeit gospel that suggests suffering is a sign of punishment from God. It is unfortunate that there are pulpits across the globe that, pre that, that preach a gospel that suggests it's your fault if you suffer in this body. Yes. That somehow you, you've done something wrong. If Maybe if you gave more money. Well, well. Oh, I can't get a witness there. I know you've heard it. Send a thousand dollar seed and God will bless your life. The, the, you, 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 will, you will have treasures from heaven that will just overflow you. you but, but, but the more you sow, the, the more you're going to reap. And they always tie it to money. And people are under the false impression that somehow you can buy your way out of suffering. Come on. And you still might be sick. People continuing to pervert the gospel. And, and this is what we fight against as the body of Christ. A fight that honestly we shouldn't have to fight. We shouldn't have to fight with each other over this issue. But Paul did. And again, it's understandable because this, this is still a new church. They're in their infancy. 
So they're still on milk. They're not on meat. And so my prayer this morning is, is that we would discover together God's truth regarding his use of suffering as a tool of development and not destruction. May we see the tool of suffering as a developmental tool rather than a destructive tool. I know, again, outside looking in, it doesn't make sense. People see us walking around struggling, they're like, and, 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 and why, why do I want to be a Christian? Hmm. Well, well, yeah. Why would I want to be that? I could do bad all by myself. Hmm. I'm already struggling. So if attaching myself to this God of yours means that I'm just going to suffer, I, I might as well just stay where I am. Hmm. And people miss it. Hmm. They misunderstand it because they're looking through natural eyes. Because they're looking through the long, wrong lens. They're using the wrong instrument. And so here in the text, we can see uh, Paul offered a strong defense against those who were questioning his pedagogy. In other words, Paul argued against those who misunderstood his conduct. You don't understand what I'm dealing with. You don't understand the reason I walk the way I walk. You don't get the God that I serve. You don't understand what I carry. And it's not to suggest that it's all about me, but it's really all about God. And so pulling out this particular pericope, we find that Paul was making a summary statement as if he was in court. Prior to this portion of scripture, Paul insisted that boasting like the false teachers was a hindrance. Yeah. He had been given visions and revelations from God that couldn't be expressed in words. He knew that if he boasted about it, it would only serve as a distraction. Yeah. Everybody doesn't need to know everything that's happened to you. Yeah. Look how God blessed me. Look what God did for me. Some people can't handle that. Come on. Quite frankly, sometimes it does sound like you boasting about yourself right. and not about God. Yeah. There are no self-made millionaires. There are no self-made anything. That's right. I'm sorry. Not sorry. Somewhere along the line, the individual got help. Somebody had to say yes to your plan. Somebody had to say yes to investing in you. Somebody had to say yes to giving you a resource. Yeah, you may have worked hard. We may have done the work, but we didn't create it ourselves. Come on. Teach. Ain't no gods around here. So he didn't want to serve as a distraction. He wanted people to understand that his weakness brought confidence to his life and ministry. And so God had written an unusual recommendation to benefit Paul. You ever ask somebody to write a recommendation for you, a recommendation letter? Right? I don't know, maybe, maybe maybe you've experienced this. I've had folks tell me, well, you write it and then I'll just sign it. Right? right? So we get to tailor, we get to craft the letter to, 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 to make us look really good and then somebody just signs it. Well, here God said, no, that's, that's, that's not how we're going to do this. I'm going to write a recommendation, but I'm not necessarily sure that this recommendation, if, if you're going to per, per, perhaps like it. So he, he writes this recommendation to benefit Paul. God gave Paul a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan as a means to torment him. That sounds a bit unfair. Come on. Right? Yes. It smells fishy. Mm -hmm. Right? It feels uncomfortable. And the consensus among scholars and theologians is that it was uncertain the type of thorn God gave to Paul. Hmm. However, we do know that God authorized it, and here's the, here's the tough part, y'all, and used Satan to execute his plan. Oh my God. Yeah, well. It's in the text. I'm not lying. It's, it's right there. Like 
Job, God permitted Satan access to his son. I just want you to sit there for a minute. Rest in that. Yes, the devil is busy. And yes, the devil sometimes does stuff. But the devil ain't got no power, no authority to do it. Honestly, if you're going to be mad at somebody, you better be mad at God. Oh, did he just say that? You better get mad at God because God is in control of it all. God's the one that allowed the access. And most of us, dare I say all of us, we can't handle that. Right? We want to blame all of the negative things. We want to blame everything on the devil. And, and we got to fight the devil. And, and, and we got to keep the devil under our feet. And, and all of that stuff. Yeah, okay. But what happens when God uses your enemy to develop you? What happens when you're on that job and you deal with that person that you cannot stand and you are given responsibility to work with that person to help that person do good on the job? Jeez. Jeez. What happens when God uses it? How do you feel? <laughs> So he, he permitted Satan access. And so, uh, uh, in this case, um, that word uh, to, to torment me means to treat with violence and insulting language. Oh my God. God allowed Satan to treat his servant with violence and and insulting language. Oh, it's tough today. Yes, it is. These grits is thick. <laughs> it's obvious that Paul wasn't excited to receive the thorn in the flesh. And, 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 and it's obvious when we are given uh, something that, that is unappealing or something that seems like it isn't beneficial, we don't get too excited about it either. As a matter of fact, I would dare to even say that we contemplate, is this really from you, God? Yes. This doesn't, this isn't God. Like this isn't, this isn't what God would do. How do you know? Right. Are you God? I know we can study the word of God. We can, and we can, we should, and, and we get an idea of who God is. But let me tell you something, uh, ma'am and sir. We cannot predict how God will respond, how he will act, or what he will do, or who he will use. Like, like he said to Joe, were you there? Were you there? When I was doing my creating thing? Were you there when I, when I put the stars in the sky and the moon to, to, to cover the night and the, the sun to, 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 to watch over the day? Were you there when I separated? Where were you? You weren't even a thought yet. None of us were. So let's stop limiting God. Let's stop putting God in a box and, and saying, if he doesn't do this or if he doesn't act like that, then it can't be God. Why don't we allow God to be God? So he wasn't, he wasn't excited, and, and, and understandably so. He, he didn't find God's recommendation to be beneficial and, and he begged him to remove it. He begged him. Might be a silly question, but I asked the text, why? Why did he ask him to remove it? Well, 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 preachers and students of the word, the text doesn't tell us, the text doesn't tell us, and my answer and excuse me, and any answer that I attempt to provide would simply be conjecture. Yeah. 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 All, right? all right? Now we can we can all speculate. We can speculate based on our own human experience. Yeah. If I was getting to throw it in my side, yeah, I would want it gone because it hurt. Right. Right. 
I don't want to be disabled. I don't want to be dealing with especially from Satan. I may be able to deal with it if it's from you, God, which actually it is from God. He just, the, you know, the devil is just the agent, the delivery method. But anything, anything that we, any answer would simply be a guess. And so perhaps a better question to ask is not why Paul beseeched the Lord three times to take it away, but rather how did God's assignment of the thorn help Paul's ministry? Come on. Come on. The better question, maybe the more refined question is, okay, God, how exactly does this help me? Yeah. Come on. How, 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 does, how does me having a thorn in my flesh get, get you glory? And, 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 and help me out. And so Paul, he was being criticized for being a suffering servant like Christ. So, so how would making him suffer in this way aid his argument? He's already suffering and now you're going to make him suffer more. So how does that help him with his testimony? How does that help him with his identity? How does that help him when he's out there ministering and, and teaching? And here it is, he's in constant pain. Mm -hmm. And some of us today may be asking similar questions to the Lord as we endure our own suffering. Oh God, how does a health crisis on top of, our, of a financial crisis benefit me? Or Lord, how does food insecurity on top of a housing insecurity convince others to trust my testimony? Come on. Wow. I mean, it makes sense, Lord. How does that work? In other words, God, how does weakness become strength? Come on. Thank you, Lord God. Well, despite Paul's request for God to reconsider his recommendation, God did not relent. Rather, he revealed his rationale. God didn't change his mind. God wasn't moved by the begging three times. Oh, how many parents out there? When you when, when your foot is down, when you set, I won't be moved on this. They can ask as many times as they want to. They can ask as many different ways. Bring your puppy dog ass to me. All the crying and all the Jesus. Come on. 
Right? When Jesus came in, Jesus wasn't blended out. Jesus ain't wearing gold chains and, and, and rocking the, the latest gear. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't have anywhere to sleep. Right? People, J Jesus lived off of the generosity of others. And so Paul modeled his ministry after Christ. And because he did that, he was criticized. Saints, when we model our ministry after Christ, we may get criticized. People may think we're silly. We may think we're foolish. But as God does, he used the foolish things to confound the wise. Right. God told Paul to trust in his grace because of its sufficiency. Said another way, God told Paul to trust in his grace because of its ability to enable a person to bravely bear the evil levied against them. Do you hear that? God's grace gives us the ability to bravely bear the evil levied against us. So why not accept God's grace? Why not trust God's grace? Now, how is this accomplished? Well, through God's power. The text, it says, his dunamis, his inherent power that is made perfect in weakness. What? Yes. On the cross at Calvary, Christ weakened himself to the point of death so that God's power would be made complete. That didn't get you? Okay. That's actually excellent news. Amen. Come on, Pastor. The grace of God is what supports our efforts to live holy in an unholy land. The grace of God is what undergirds our ability to rightly represent the Lord. The grace of God is what sustains us through our walks through the valley of the shadow of death, our climbs up the mountain, and our journey in this realm. Yeah. And so Paul, after having this, this conversation with God, recognized the relevance of God's recommendation and resultantly revised his perspective. Yes. Sometimes, yes. sometimes it takes take that conversation to help bring us to the place where we can say, okay, God, I understand. Come on. Or, okay, God, I may not understand it all, but I, I, I accept it. Yeah. And I trust you. Yes. See, Paul said, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul understood it. Paul got it. It's in my weakness that I am made strong. It's in God that I get my strength. Not myself. Not me. Not my own doing. You know, I was, I was putting this together. I started thinking about my girls. And, and as kids, every last one of them at some point told me, Daddy, I can do it. Mm. <laughs> right? And we've all said that. I don't need your help. I got it. Because we're trying to prove that it's it's in us. We don't we don't want to, to depend on anyone for anything. And, and yeah, that's that's great. But at some point in time we do have to depend on another. Because it's not all about us. It's all about God. And so Paul reassured himself of the resourcefulness of the thorn in his flesh. You hear that? He reassured himself of the resourcefulness of the thorn in his flesh. So he, he didn't reject it, he accepted it. Okay, God, if this is the if this is your will for me, then I choose to accept it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was on his knees praying to the Lord. Father, if it be your will, take the up this cup. Pass for me, but not my will, thy will be done. Jesus had to reject himself in order to accept what God had given him. So if Jesus had to do it, what makes us think that we won't? I'm just saying. 
Think about it. He re Paul reinterpreted what was previously viewed as being harmful as being helpful. Therefore, by shifting his dependence on himself to dependence on God, more specifically the grace of God, he was guaranteed to receive incredible strength. Right? This is it, I guarantee you. <laughs> Now, now, just, just pause for, for a quick minute. Come on. Paul's defense against his critics was that his dependence on God did not negate or nullify the validity of his apostolic ministry. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, Paul's disability in no way discredited his authority as a leader or his witness as a believer. Again, to those that downplay the suffering of believers and attribute it solely to being punishment by God, they are confused and mistaken. Yeah. And saints of God, don't allow anybody to discredit your testimony. Yeah. What did Pastor Reggie tell us? That we are a credible witness. Yeah. Each and every one of us have credibility to witness, to testify about the goodness, the grace, and the mercy of God. Doesn't matter your circumstances. You can live in a mansion or you can live in a cardboard box. God is still God and He is still great and greatly to be praised. It doesn't make you less of a believer. It doesn't make you less of a disciple. It doesn't make you less of a witness because you suffer, because you struggle. His power is perfected in weakness. The truth I offer of the suffering that we experience is that it is a means by which God draws us to depend on his all-sufficiency. Yes. See, God levels the playing field for all of us so that none of us get to boast in ourselves. The Bible says it is by grace through faith that you have saved, been saved, right? right? Not that we may boast because we can't boast. It's not a works-based salvation. You can't earn it. You can be as nice as you want to be and still end up in the wrong place. I'm, hey, that's the Bible. It's not. It's the Bible. Niceness doesn't access heaven. Faith in Christ does. Now you should be nice. No, no, no. Okay. You don't get to be mean. You don't get to be cantankerous and stink. Right. There should be a change. <laughs> but 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 I don't care how many times you give to the homeless or you feed the hungry. That that That's all right. that stuff is great. Right. But that doesn't merit heaven. Come on. Amen. Don't you allow anybody else to tell you that it does. Right? right? So the, the thorn that Paul was given, and I'm and, and I'm almost done. The thorn that Paul was given served three purposes. Right. And they're found in the text. Okay, the first purpose is the thorn served as an endorsement from God on his servant Paul. Served as an endorsement okay. from God Good. on his servant Paul. You, you, you can't have Christ without the cross. Right. Come on. You cannot have Christ Without the cross. That is to say, salvation absent suffering is insufficient. Jesus had to suffer and die. Now, we don't have to endure the pain of the cross, but we do have to live a crucified life. A life contrary to the ways of the world. Because Paul was considered weak, God used the thorn to further weaken him thereby endorsing Paul as an accurate representation of a Christ follower. The thorn served as an endorsement from God on his servant Paul. Your suffering, your weakness serves as an endorsement from God that you belong to him. In addition to the thorn being an endorsement, the second purpose that served that, that, that it served was as an encouragement from God for his servant Paul. 
Paul had been privileged to see something that no one else had, and, and there was potential for him to brag about. Right? You, 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 know, you know some people that, that talk about, oh, I'm part of this exclusive club. Right, exclusivity. I've, I've been to places, I've seen so many things, and, and sometimes you just feel like, shut up, I don't care about all that. <laughs> and Paul said, I could be that guy. I really could be that guy. As a matter of fact, he was that guy at one point in time. Paul probably wasn't a dude you wanted to hang out with. You know, he was a bit arrogant, a bit cocky. Bit elitist. Yeah, he was. And he said, I I I I I could have I could have done that. So so God used the thorn mm -hmm. to encourage Paul to resist the urge to boast about his experience in the third heaven as it would have drawn attention away from the message of Christ. That's why I say everybody don't need to know everything about us. Sure. Because it's a misrepresentation that they'll start to go after it, chase after the wrong thing. The body of Christ is, is both inclusive and exclusive. Mm -hmm. It's paradoxical. Mm -hmm. Right? It invites all, but it only receives those that believe. Mm -hmm. So it is inclusive in that you only get in through faith. But everybody is invited to the party. So it says, look, I'm not, I, don't, don't, don't brag about that stuff. It's, it's meaningless. And so Paul pivoted from begging God to remove the thorn to boasting in the resourcefulness of the thorn. So instead of asking God to remove it, he started to boast about it. And again, it wasn't to boast to bring him attention, but it's to bring God attention. So he didn't walk around and say, hey, look at me, y'all. I'm weak. Look at me, God. Look at me. I got a lip now, y'all. Serve God. That's that's not at all the reason. Right? While other teachers were discussing their mystical encounters and, and, and talking about philosophy and, and things that were probably over some folks' heads, making it seem like they were so wonderful and, and trying to be impressive to the people, Paul continued to let his light shine so that others would see his good works and give God glory in heaven. He mirrored Christ in that his speech and actions were in concert with one another. So he didn't say one thing and do another. He maintained the standard established by God in his living and shared that standard with others. Right. And so finally, the third purpose that the thorn served was as an empowerment from God yes. to his servant Paul. Yes. What is clear is that God's strength is found in weakness. Oh, if you didn't hear anything else I said today, oh, his strength is found in weakness. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a counterintuitive notion. It doesn't make sense that strength will be found in weakness. Abandonment instead of acquisition is the mentality that Jesus promoted. Abandonment rather than acquisition is the mentality Jesus promoted. Don't believe me? Look at the word of God. Whoever loses their life, or excuse me, whoever holds on to their life, will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will get will have it, right? So abandonment rather than acquisition is what Jesus taught. Jesus didn't talk that we we supposed to run around here and try to gather up every single thing that we possibly can. Right? So Paul's strength came from his dependence on God. Not from his intelligence, yes. not from his background as a Pharisee, yes. and not from his Roman citizenship. Yes. 
The more he relied on God, the stronger he became. And friends, the more we rely on God, the stronger we become. Paul told the church that he had been afflicted beyond his strength and thought he was going to die. But he realized that, uh, that, that what he went through was designed to convince him to depend on God and not himself. And saints, I believe that's our testimony today. That what we go through is not designed to destroy us, but to develop us. What we are going through is designed to de for us to depend on God even more so. Yeah, we got skill. Yeah, we got talent. Yeah, we got ability. But absent the Holy Spirit, it is nothing. It may do something in this realm, yeah, but it won't do nothing in the realm that counts. That's why those who don't trust God are, 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 are seeming to, 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 to thrive in this world because that's what happens in this world. And so we don't we don't we don't take our cues from them. Oh, they they're doing all right. They they and they don't trust. No, okay. Well, that's because it's this world. It applies here. But see, for us, right, it's the opposite. Right? Moving away from dependence on self and moving towards dependence on God. Right? Moving closer and closer and closer to God. So, God has and will continue to put us through things that are tailored made for us to choose to surrender so that he can take control. There will continue to be things that you encounter as you journey towards heaven. That are specifically for you and no one else. So that you can choose. Because you got to choose it. To surrender. Here's a situation. That you believe you have the power to deal with. And maybe in the past you were able to, to handle it. But now God said, okay, here's an opportunity for you to choose me and actually see that it was always me and it was never you. See, sometimes we're under the, 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 the disillusion that, that it was us. And God comes in and, and again, what, there, there goes that grace. There goes that grace. He comes back around and helps us to see that it is better to choose weakness so that we can be strong rather than to depend on our own strength which is, which is severely limited. And so Paul concluded by telling them that for the sake of Christ he delighted in weaknesses, in hardships, in insults, in persecutions, and in difficulties. No, it wasn't because he wanted the acclaim. Rather, he discovered the truth of the favor of Christ. He insisted that when he became weak, that he was actually strong. See, the world thinks that weakness is limiting, but God says it's actually a leveraging. Our weakness is a leverage against the enemy. Whereas the world sees it as a limitation. And so... That's the blessing that blasts the tension of the text. Mm -hmm. The thorn might be present. The weapon might thorn. Yes. And we might be frustrated by its impact. Yes. But the thorn doesn't diminish our character, yes. our connection, or our credibility. Mm -hmm. It safeguards us against the conceit seeking to steal that which does not belong to it. As disciples of Christ, it is inevitable that we will face some form of suffering. Jesus suffered, Paul suffered, and we too will suffer. The great news is that our suffering 
is not, <clears throat> excuse me, haphazard or coincidental. Many will see us in the midst of suffering and question the presence and participation of God. My, my recommendation today is don't get upset. Yeah. Remember that, <clears throat> that there will be times when we will have to defend our dependence on the Lord. Yeah. We will come in contact with those who need clarification as to why we brag about our weaknesses and hardships and difficulties. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Just let them know that those predicaments are producing the power necessary to overcome the pain and to obey God's will. Our circumstances might not change, mm -hmm. but if we let him, mm -hmm. God will change us for his glory yeah. and for our good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen.